Okay, so operant conditioning has a lot of tedious vocab with it. It's a little bit easier to come up with examples for though, right? So if you track along with this, I'm gonna explain to you the, the names that you need to know for operant conditioning, but I'm also, gonna, I'm also gonna track with you on how to distinguish between these difficult vocab terms, because they're very similar. You have schedules of reinforcement. You have positive and negative reinforcement and positive and negative punishment. And it's enough to make you go crazy. So here's the key. We need a light bulb moment here. The goal is by the end of this that you feel much more confident about what all of these weird terms mean. But you're probably going to have to write them down. So you're going to want to write down some stuff about how it works. So let's start here. Let's start with this guy, E.L. Thorndike. So Edward Thorndike we mentioned before was a student of William James. He went to Harvard, he studied under the functionalist, he was very interested in animal behavior modification. So when he became a psychologist and he graduated from Harvard, that's where he started his research. So Thorndike published several books about how to train animals, right? And it started with this, this puzzle box, right? This operant chamber, so that's a vocab term. An operant chamber is like, is, is this, this box that's been constructed that you can fit an animal inside safely and humanely where they have to perform some kind of action in order to get the door to open, right? Or they have to get, perform some kind of action to get food to fall in there, right? It's, it, it's an action-based chamber, right? It's a box, basically, where animals can be, uh, they, they have to perform an, a behavior in order to gain a reward. So Thorndike is best known for his work with cats in this puzzle box. And basically, when you incentivize the cat with the, the scent of food, then they, they're very motivated to try to get out of the box. And so they learn how to push a lever, or they learn how to climb, uh, climb up on this little ledge. They, they have to perform a specific action. And what Thorndike figured out, here's your buzz phrase for a test, is what he called the law of effect. It's very simple. It's so simple, in fact, that you probably take it for granted. This is not seem profound, but he's the one that theorized it. That if you want behaviors to be reinforced in animals, you have to reward them for that. And if you want animals to stop participating in behaviors, you have to punish the behaviors, right? So it's a real simple theory that behaviors that are reinforced or that are rewarded, they become stronger, they are strengthened, right? And what that looks like is simple. Whenever an animal achieves a desirable outcome, it's gonna reinforce the, the behavior. And you're an animal, let's say that you study for a test and you get a good grade. Well, that's gonna reinforce the behavior of studying the next time. But punishment works too. What if you don't get a desirable outcome? What if you study for a test and fail it? Well, punishment is going to diminish the behavior. It's not gonna strengthen it. Right, so if you don't get your desirable outcome, you're less likely to participate in the behavior again. Right, so here's a big giant hint, elbow, elbow, elbow for your test. One of the things that Skinner and Thorndike figured out is when you're training the behavior of animals and even people, it's much more effective to reward them than it is to punish them. It's much more effective to reinforce a behavior than it is to punish a behavior. In other words, Instead of focusing on punishing the behaviors that you want, say you're a teacher and you're in like an elementary school classroom. Well, if you want all the kids to sit down, then you're gonna openly reward the one student at the table who's doing that. Oh, so look how Sally is sitting down at the table right now. She's sitting so well. Sally, you get four gold stars for that. And then the kids are like, they pop down, right? So instead of punishing three kids for what they're not doing, you reinforce the behavior that you want to see strengthened. And so the other kids are gonna learn observationally and they're gonna duplicate that and they're gonna get reinforced. Oh, now Timmy's sitting, gold star Timmy. Timmy's excited. Look, Taylor's sitting down and now you give gold stars to everybody when they participate in the behavior. It reinforces it, it strengthens it. Like your dog, the reinforcement has to, has to come very closely behind the behavior. If you reward, like your dog sat today and put its paw up and then you went to school and you came home seven hours later and give the dog a treat, the dog doesn't associate, too much time has passed. That's an interval, right? Too much time has passed. You have to reinforce the behavior almost immediately and you have to do it at a fixed schedule instead of a variable schedule. So that's Thorndike, the law of effect in training behaviors in animals specifically. 
Skinner is a little bit more widespread. You may get more questions about Skinner. There's a couple buzzwords like shaping. Shaping is a Skinner term, right? So if you get this question about Skinner and one of the answer choices is shaping, it's probably the answer. And shaping is the idea of like, okay, we rewarded the dog when he sat, but how do we teach him to roll over? It's the example from yesterday. All right, well, you reward the dog when he sits. So now he's sitting to get a reward. You gotta progress it to the next step. You need another level, a more complex behavior. Reward the dog when he lays down. So he's sitting for free. You're no longer rewarding him for sitting. You don't reward him until he lays down. So the dog's eager to get the treat, so he's gonna try all of these things, right? So then you gotta get him to roll over. So you get the dog to sit, the dog lays down thinking they'll get a treat, they don't get one, you, you train them to roll over. Once they roll over, then you start reinforcing that behavior. That's called shaping. So you, you start with a basic behavior and then you withhold the reinforcement until we get a complex behavior, right? And before you know it, it's a two, three, four step process before the dog is getting a reward. So they learn the sequence. I sit, I lay down, I roll over, then I get a treat. Right, and using shaping, they've gotten mice to like climb up trees and go specific paths and, and mazes and they've taught animals how to like go into burning houses and find people and, and walk out. I mean, they're using almost like this algorithm of, of reinforcement in order to get very complex behaviors. So you punish a, a, a mouse, like let's say the mouse is walking through the maze and you've got this electrode in their brain and like a battery pack and they're walking and like they turn left and you don't want them to so you hit this buzzer ah, and the mouse turns right and then you give them this dopamine reward you stimulate the reward pathway and they're all excited so they keep moving right because without dopamine you just sit there so they keep moving through the maze and then they turn left Bzz, ah, okay and then so they turn right and you give them dopamine so they're motivated by reinforcement and by punishment right so you're punishing behaviors you want to stop and you're rewarding behaviors that you want to continue right it's like a good example of when punishment is not exactly as effective. A lot of you are athletes, right? So your coach is not gonna punish what you're not doing, right? They're not gonna punish what you're not doing. We're just talking about your technique or something like that. They're going to reinforce what you are doing, right? So if you ever get a chance to coach like little kids, use reinforcement. So I like how Tim, look where Timmy's feet are. Everybody's feet look like Timmy's. Watch Timmy's first step. Excellent first step, Timmy, high five. Everybody do what Timmy did right there. That's how you train a behavior. You reinforce the model. You reinforce what you want. So you're making Timmy happy. He's more likely to repeat it, but also the other people are seeing the effective model. You don't yell at all the other kids for doing it wrong, which is what a lot of coaches do, right? I can't believe your feet are horrible. And you're like looking for feet. What do I do, coach? It's like when coaches give you very vague feedback. Good, great job. What, what did I do that was great, coach? And you're not gonna ask that. You're just like a little like attention hound. So you're high five, yay, I did something good. Maybe it was when I stood there or maybe it was when I moved my feet or my hands, I don't know. So like you should give very specific feedback, right? And this is what you do. You say, here's what I like about that. Right? Here's what I like about that, Lauren. I like that you move two steps to your right before you cross the ball over. That's very specific feedback. Okay? So, then we talk about this token economy. This is also something else that, that Skinner learned about. The token economy is this idea of tokens. Right? So if you use a, a, a behavior modification system where you reward kids by giving them like stars. Right? Or a good example would be like your subway card. Like if you buy 10 sandwiches, you get a free one. Well, they punch one out every time. Those are tokens. Every time you get some reward and then you cash them in, right? That's a token economy. So like little kids get five gold stars. And if they have five gold stars by the end of the week, they get to get something out of the treasure box, right? Those are tokens. It's a token economy, right? The Skinner box, we talked about the Skinner box. I'll show you a better version of it here. The Skinner box is similar to the, the, the cat puzzle box that Thorndike used. And it's basically this idea that Skinner constructed a box that's small enough that as the rat moves around in there, he's going to inadvertently bump into the lever. And when, the, when the, the rat bumps into the lever, a food pellet falls out. Oh, light bulb. And maybe the rat doesn't know at first. Maybe it takes time to reinforce the behavior. But the first time the rat bumps into the lever, they get food and they're like, oh, how do I make that happen again? And they start moving around and they bump the lever again and it comes out. 
And they start pushing the lever a bunch and they start falling out and now they're all excited and the dopamine in their little rat brains is like going crazy. That's how you reinforce behavior, right? Now for you, we don't have to let it accidentally happen. You're consciously aware that we can explain it to you. Push A7 and watch what happens. <gasps> Chips came out, right? Like, so that's an example of reinforcement. You put your money in a vending machine and you push the button and the, and the food falls out. And you trust that it's going to happen because you're so conditioned that my action will cause this result that you take it for granted. The reality is this, what if a vending machine was like a slot machine? And it was like, <laughs> it was like a crapshoot to see if it actually came out. Okay, fingers crossed, fingers crossed, A7, and you've been through that, maybe it gets stuck. No, it didn't work. And you try another dollar, right? That's, that's an unpredictable reinforcement. That's what's known as a variable ratio reinforcement. We'll get into those examples in a minute. But if the rat pushed the lever and it didn't always produce the outcome, it's not gonna strengthen the behavior. The rat's gonna have to learn every time I push this lever, food comes out. That's gonna reinforce the behavior because they learn it's a one-to-one -one ratio. I'm not gonna risk putting my money in that machine if it's maybe gonna get me a bag of chips, right? So more things about Skinner. Interesting thing about Skinner is he didn't just work with rats in his Skinner box. He also worked with pigeons in the Skinner box. It was slightly modified. Um, if you get, let me go back a couple slides and show you a photo. So here's a photo of the Skinner box. You can see that it's almost an exact scale, right, of the, uh, the mock-up here. But pigeons, as birds, are more intelligent than rats are, so they can be trained at a higher level of conditioning, right? So he figured out that you could get pigeons to... To, to use their beaks to peck in very specific locations, right? So for instance, what if we put a key here and the pigeon hits the edge of the key and nothing comes out? Well, they have to hit the middle of the key and they have to do it when the light on the left comes on versus the light on the right that comes on, the red light or the green light. So pigeons can be trained to do really complex things. In fact, this is kind of comical actually, the United States Navy gave Skinner $25,000 to pay for research on a pigeon guided missile system. That's right, you heard that correctly. The whole idea here is that what if, and they replicated this on Brain Games actually, or they, it was a different, it was like a spin off of Brain Games, it was on Netflix. Um, and, and they had pigeons and they trained them to peck on these iPad screens, and the iPads were controlling a drone, and the drone was going up and through all these like suspended um, uh, hula hoops at varying levels, right? Yes. I would, as, I would assume, you mean like regular pigeons as in pigeons just off the street and not trained carrier pigeons? Because I think the species is pretty much the same, right? Well, I'm pretty sure that, I, I thought they were just... Well, I, I mean, I, this would be your common, yeah, this would be the regular. So he would be using like the common pigeon. So yeah, which is, I mean, it's, it's worth noting because if you have like different species of birds, like what if you used a, you know, what if you used a, you know, a seagull? Probably not going to work. <laughs> so a pigeon, yeah, there's a certain amount of brain tissue that the animal has to possess to be able to like problem solve. Not even, that's not even the right word, to be able to like associate, right? So the pigeon guided missile system was kind of an interesting concept. It's basically like, what if he could train them to peck in the middle of a crosshair and keep the crosshair on a target? So they printed out these pictures of like warships and, the, and basically like different varying degrees of where the warship was. Right? And so they put the food, the little like bird seed, where they want the screen to move, right? So I'll explain it this way. What if we have a picture, and I wish I had a still shot of this, where there's half, the half, the back half of a warship is, is in the crosshair. Well, you train the pigeon by putting the food on the ship, not the center of the page. So what happens is the pigeon is trained in its little mind that I have to put the, I have to peck in the middle of where the ship is to get food. So by doing, in so doing, it's controlling the rudder. So when you give them a guidance system and they're hitting this like screen, it's actually controlling the rudder, right? So it's actually, it's a successful process, but it's not worth the time and the expense and the training. So the Navy passes on it, but this is not an ancient, you know, we're not talking 70 years ago. This happened in the 1980s when we have like, you know, rocket powered and rocket propelled uh, missiles, which is really kind of silly. 
to think about. But that's B.F. Skinner. Now, to understand reinforcers, let's go through the tedious vocab here. The first thing I want you to understand is in operant conditioning, you have two ways to, you have two ways to respond to the behavior. You can reinforce the behavior, or you can punish the behavior. You can reinforce the behavior, or you can punish the behavior. So it's a two-step process. If you get some test question that gives you a scenario, like a pigeon is given food every time it hits a key, what is the behavior? The behavior is the pigeon hitting the key. What is the reward? It gets food, right? So unlike classical conditioning, where you have to know what's the unconditioned stimulus, what's the unconditioned response, what's the conditioned stimulus, what's the conditioned response, and the question would be phrased something like this, right? Um, they would say something like, Pavlov um, trained dogs to salivate at the sound of a tone. And they would say, what is the conditioned stimulus? The conditioned stimulus is the tone, is the sound. What is the conditioned response? The salivation, right? If they said, what is the unconditioned stimulus? You would say the dog's salivating at the smell of meat because that was before the learning happened. So classical conditioning is a little bit more complicated as a test question. Operant conditioning is easier, but there's two steps to it. You have to realize what's the behavior, and then the second step is, is it being reinforced or is it being punished, right? Because you can either reinforce the behavior or you can punish the behavior. So we have a behavior and we have an outcome. The outcome is either reinforcement or it is punishment. So think R for reinforce, R for reward. So anything that you do as a reward that strengthens the behavior or increases the likelihood that it's gonna happen again, that's a reinforcement. So we say something like, Charlie gets $10 for every A on his report card. Well, that's positive reinforcement. Right? They're reinforcing the behavior of getting good grades by adding a reinforcement, by adding something. So positive reinforcement adds a stimulus as a reward. R for reward, R for reinforcement. Negative reinforcement might be the hardest one. It might be the hardest one because negative reinforcement is still a reinforcement. How do we reward a behavior by taking something away? Right, so you're gonna read positive and negative and your mind's gonna go to this place of like, well, positive is good and negative is bad. Not in terms of conditioning. In terms of conditioning, positive is to add, negative is to subtract something. So positive reinforcement is reinforcing a behavior by adding a stimulus, right? You're happy with your friend, you give them a high five, right? So you're reinforcing them by adding a high five. It's positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is removing something as a reward now, not as a punishment, as a reward. So an example would be like, I like the seatbelt example on the screen there. You get in your car, you turn the car on, it's beeping incessantly. So how it would be phrased on the test question is removing the annoying sound when someone puts on the seatbelt. So the way the question is phrased is gonna tell you what's the behavior, and what's the outcome? The behavior in this case is putting the seatbelt on. The outcome is removing the sound. Here's a good example that people tend to get wrong. Taking headache medicine to eliminate a migraine is actually negative reinforcement. Why? What's the behavior in that scenario? Taking the headache medicine. And how is that behavior being reinforced? Because it works. When you take headache medicine and the pain of the migraine is removed, when the headache is removed, it's gonna reinforce the thought that, okay, if I have a headache, I take this pill and it works. So negative reinforcement is the hardest one. The other ones are easy because your mind's just gonna automatically default. Like that's your prototype for negative is bad. So your mind's gonna default to, you, you ignore the reinforcement and you look at the negative. Negative means to subtract, right? It means to subtract. And people get that wrong all the time. They mistake negative reinforcement for, pu for positive punishment, right? So let's look at punishment, right? Okay, let's talk about primary and secondary. I guess we're getting ahead of ourselves here. This is a question I saw in an FRQ a few years ago. It threw a bunch of people for a loop. I've got it on the next slide here. You need to know the difference between a primary reinforcer and a secondary reinforcer. 
So something that is a primary reward versus what's considered a secondary reward. It's not first and second level. A primary reinforcer is any reward that you get that is a basic biological urge. So you reward your third graders with candy for getting a question right. Well, candy is food. Food is a primary reinforcer. A secondary reinforcer is some kind of token, right? You reward your, your, your third graders with a sticker for getting the questions right. So if you get a test question that says your parents give you money for good grades, is money a primary reinforcer or a secondary reinforcer? It's a secondary reinforcer because it can be used to buy food or used to buy something, but it's a token. It doesn't actually solve a biological need, right? It doesn't solve a biological problem. And I know you're going to think candy. Well, candy's not healthy, but okay, don't overthink it. Candy is something you ingest, right? If it's food, water, shelter, it's primary. In fact, even probably, I don't know that you would get this example in AP. You would get this example in college. So some sexual favor would be a primary reinforcer because it's meeting a biological urge, right? So immediate versus delayed reinforcers. A secondary reinforcer is something that's considered a token, right? You gave me money. It's still a strong reinforcer. You gave me money for good grades, but money doesn't solve my hunger. I have to take the money somewhere and trade it for food, right? So a secondary reinforcer is something that, ha that, that can be traded for a primary reinforcer. Yes? Yeah, they can, absolutely. Okay. Because money might be a greater motivator than candy, right? So that's a good point also. Secondary reinforcers can be a stronger reinforcer. They're not secondary because they're weaker. I like that. They're secondary because they're not immediately solving a biological urge. Or, or Think of it as like, if it doesn't solve an id problem, it's probably secondary, right? Look at it this way. This is actually printed on the wall. You probably walked by it and not even noticed it. It's there, up there every day. Primary reinforcers aid survival. Secondary reinforcers can be traded for things that aid survival, right? So if it's food, if it's a place to sleep, it's like physical safety. Like a good example of negative reinforcement that's a primary reinforcer. It's like super, this is like a super intense example, so I apologize. But like I gave this example yesterday. If you're being tortured for information, that's negative reinforcement. Here's why. When you participate in the desired behavior, which is giving them information, your tormentors stop torturing you. So it's reinforcing your cooperation by removing something. And that is a primary reinforcer because it's aiding in survival. They're eliminating physical pain from your body, right? So in that regard, you could say taking headache medicine to eliminate a migraine is negative reinforcement. It's a primary reinforcer. Like headache medicine might be a primary reinforcer because we're eliminating pain. It's like actual biological need in the body. That's not an example they'll give you, luckily. They're going to say, like, you know, trading a sandwich for, I don't know, help on an exam. And you'd say, well, that's positive reinforcement. Like the sandwich is a primary reinforcer because it's food, right? So, like, something that aids in survival is a primary reinforcer. Something that's not, some kind of token, is a secondary reinforcer. All right, now let's get into schedules. Woo saw here. Let's relax. Let's look at the stressful vocab. Let's break it up. Here's the strategy. Don't try to memorize these. Don't do it. Just look at what the actual terminology means. So I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you how to dif differentiate here. The word fixed means predictable and unchanging. Continuous. Fixed equals predictable and unchanging. It'll make more sense when you see examples. Right? You get a paycheck every two weeks. It is fixed. It doesn't change. Every, every time two weeks comes, comes and goes, there's a paycheck. You, you can expect it. It is, it is unwavering, unchanging, and it is predictable. I will get my paycheck on the whatever. It's fixed. It's not unpredictable. It's not unchanging. It is set. Variable is the opposite of that. The word variable refers to something that is unpredictable. 
unpredictable. If you don't know when your paycheck is going to arrive, that would be a variable reinforcer. So how does it apply to things like training a dog? Well, if the dog shakes and doesn't know that it's going to get a treat afterwards, that's a variable ratio reinforcer because maybe sometimes you reinforce the dog and sometimes you don't. Here's a good example. What if you go to class late every single day and like on the 16th time you showed up late, your teacher marks you tardy? What? You have been conditioned, your behavior has been conditioned to believe that you can come in late. In other words, your tardiness has been reinforced. Your tardiness has been reinforced. Every time you participate in a behavior and there's not a negative outcome, that behavior is reinforced. So now all of a sudden, there's this unpredictable consequence that happens sometimes and not other times. And the, and the problem with that is you don't know how to predict when it's going to be a, a, a tardy and when it's not going to be a tardy. So when you look at it in everyday terms, it makes sense. Variable means unpredictable. Fixed means predictable. It means steady amount, unchanging. It's predictable. Let's break down the other two words. Ratio, you learned from math. It's like a probability term, right? Ratio is like the number of occurrences, right? If we have, I like this, I like this example as a metaphor, right? So like you're talking about like teenagers and behavior modification with teenagers and basically you can give this metaphor, right? So let's say we have this fish tank full of Skittles. I don't know, full of Skittles. There's 10,000 Skittles. There's 10,001 Skittles in the fish tank. So 10,000 of the 10,001 Skittles in the fish tank are perfectly fine. You pick up a purple one, you eat it, it's great flavored, it's like whatever, awesome. But one Skittle out of the 10,001 will kill you instantly. Uh-oh. Well, the odds are not great that you're going to die when you grab one off the top. It's pretty good odds. There's a good ratio. There's a good chance that I could grab three handfuls of Skittles and not die. So even though the odds are really low, you have to think about would you take the chance? And you might say, yeah, we're right here in your cold emotional state. It's easy to say, I'll take 10,001 odds. But will you though? If the chances are that you will die instantly if you guess wrong, are you willing to play a 10,001 game that you're gonna die? Probably not. Right? Now, you might have said it was a lottery ticket. If you say, I'll trade five of my dollars for the chance at 10,000, let's say one dollar, or one dollar scratch off, because let's keep the marble, or let's keep the, uh, the analogy the same with the Skittles. Right? If I spend one of my dollars and I have a chance to win 10,000, maybe I'll take those odds, because the cost is not that, you know, it's a whole classic cost benefit analysis. The cost is, is worth. The, the risk, the financial risk. If one of those Skittles will kill you instantly, it may not be worth 10,001 odds, right? So what does that mean? It means that the ratio matters. The ratio matters. The ratio is the number of Skittles in the tank. The ratio is the number of times something occurs. The statistical likelihood that it will occur, right? So for instance, playing the lottery is a good example of a variable ratio schedule. It's variable because it's unpredictable. How many lottery tickets are you going to have to scratch off over the course of your life before you win any amount of money at all? It's unpredictable. Here's why. What if the Florida lottery made a predictable pattern? Well, that's not good. They're going to lose money. In fact, the only reason that gambling works at all is because there's a chance you might win some money, but if nobody ever won any money, there's no reinforcement at all and it wouldn't work. Another good example is not lottery tickets. What about a slot machine? This is a classic example. The slot machine. Quarter, quarter, quarter. Here's the deal. On any given slot machine pull, there's a one in whatever chance that that's going to hit and you're going to win. But you know that there is a chance. You know that it's a small chance. But if no one ever won money in a slot machine, no one would put money into a slot machine. So that's the key. What if it's not a slot machine? What if it's training your dog? If you never, ever, 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 ever give the dog a treat, they're gonna stop performing the behavior. 
So in other words, even if you just slightly and occasionally, or there's a chance of a reinforcement, it's a possibility that the behavior is going to continue, right? So you'll, t you'll play the odds when you're driving. You'll play the ratio odds when you're driving. How many times do I have to get in the car and drive and speed before I get a ticket finally? It's good odds. I'll play the odds. Sucks when I lose, right? But that's a ratio. A ratio is a number of occurrences, right? It's a statistical likelihood. So a question might say, going to, a, going to a casino and pulling a slot machine is an example of which? And it's going to give you all the answers. And you're going to say, that's a variable ratio reinforcement. It's variable because you can't predict how many times you have to pull the lever or if it's ever going to hit at all. But you know there's a chance, right? Speeding in traffic, that's a variable ratio reinforcer. Or punisher, I would say, right? Because there's an unpredictable amount of times that you have to speed before you finally get caught. Now, what if it was like every third car got pulled over in a checkpoint? That's fixed. That's a fixed ratio. We know exactly what to expect. Then you're like, one, right? It's fixed. Your paycheck every two weeks is a fixed ratio reinforcer. You know that paycheck is going to come in two weeks. You can predict it. It's a number of occurrences and it's exact, right? Back to the subway, right? You buy 10 sandwiches and you get one for free. That's a fixed ratio reinforcer. It's a predictable amount and you know how much you have to spend or you know how many times you have to go there. It's predictable. It's a stronger reinforcer because you know exactly what to expect. Variable is not. You're taking a chance. You're playing the odds, right? Uh, another example of a variable ratio would be like fly fishing or any fishing, right? You don't know how many times you're going to have to cast before you catch a fish, right? It's unpredictable. It's varied. Unless you're like a fish whisperer and assassin, which some of you might be, and you're like, well, no, I pull one in about every 10 times, right? Whatever. Every, how many casts do I have to make before I catch one? It's, you don't know. It's unpredictable. It's unpredictable. It's varied. The number, like last time I went fishing, I might have cast twice and caught two fish. This time I cast 42 times and didn't cast, catch any. It's an unpredictable amount. You don't have total confidence that it's going to happen on that turn, in other words, right? That's what variable means. It's so unpredictable that you don't know for sure if it's going to happen, right? What are the chances that when I, I touch this hot wire, it's going to be live? You don't know how to predict it, right? It doesn't happen every time you touch a wire. So that's variable versus fixed. So ratio means the number of occurrences or the statistical likelihood, right? I have to pull this lever 72 times one time, and the next time somebody pulls it once and it hits. It's unpredictable. So if ratio is the number of occurrences, interval is a unit of time that has passed, right? So I'll give you a big, huge, massive hint. Intervals are always going to be measured in units of time, seconds, minutes, hours, days, months. So now, and I mean how much time has passed from the behavior to the outcome. So here's a good example. You're driving and you go through one of those stoplight cameras. Uh-oh. And you're just waiting. Six days goes by. I'm good. On the seventh day, you get a ticket in the mail. Dang it. It's an unpredictable amount of time that has passed from the behavior to the reinforcer. Dog pees on the rug at 10 a.m. today while you're at school. You come home at 4 p.m., <gasps> start beating the dog, which is not nice. You shouldn't do that anyway. Start yelling at the dog, right? The dog's like, what's this lady's problem? They have no idea. Too much time has passed. So intervals are always going to be units of time measure. If the answer isn't minutes, seconds, hours, days, weeks, months, years, it's not intervals, right? The number of pulls on a slot machine arm is, is a specific behavior. It's not a unit of time. Now, if we wanted to make a slot machine an interval, it would get weird. If you're like, all right, so I pull the slot machine handle and nothing happens, and I walk away, and 32 seconds later, money starts kicking out, well, then it would have to be interval. So it has to be a unit of time, right? So teenage kid breaks curfew, goes out, does something wrong, breaks all the rules. Mom doesn't find out about it until two months later and then punishes them. You're like, well... It's been two months, mom, right? Unit of time, interval. How much time has passed from the behavior to the outcome? So interval refers to amount of time. Ratio refers to the number of occurrences, right? 
You reward your dog every time she shakes. Fixed ratio reinforcer. You catch a fish, you know, who knows, at an unpredictable amount of cast. Variable ratio. You cast your line and sit in a chair and wait for four hours before you catch a fish. Now it's an interval. And how do we know it's an interval? Because of a unit of time. Four hours has passed between your, your cast and the catch, the reel, right? So units of time are intervals, right? How much time has passed, right? That's the key. Like your phone, alerts on your phone. They happen at a variable interval schedule. You get four alerts immediately, and then you have to wait 10 minutes before you get another one, and then 32 minutes before you get another one. Or let's be honest, every 12 and a half seconds you get an alert on your phone, you're at 2% by lunch, right? But it's unpredictable. It's an unpredictable amount of time in between each of your alerts. So if we're measuring it in units of time, it's an interval schedule, right? So let's just go over it then. Fixed versus variable and ratio versus interval. Interval. So a fixed ratio every so many, right? After every nth behavior, right, is what it says. After every 10 coffees, you get a free one, right? Buy one, get one free. That's a fixed ratio. For every one box of cereal I get, I get a free one, right? It's fixed. Variable means it's unpredictable number, right? The slot machine example or, or fly fishing. Intervals. How much time has passed? It's a unit of time, right? If it's fixed, we know how much time. Like every single week, right? Or let's say like, um, let's say like, yeah, that's a good example. Like you, you go to work and then you make your commission a week later, right? You apply to college and then in three weeks you find out if you got in, right? It's got to be a unit of time. Unpredictable, again, it's going to be like checking for alerts on your phone. It's unpredictable how much time occurs in between them. All right, so I want to show you some examples of this, and this is from the Big Bang Theory. Um, and I like this first one. There's two video clips from the Big Bang Theory. In this first one, Sheldon is going to use operant conditioning to shape Penny's behavior, if you're familiar with the, um, the characters in the show. And this is going to be using operant conditioning, wait for it, to uh, shape Penny's behavior. He's rewarding behaviors with a positive reinforcement. Oh, YouTube ads, all right. Let's get some volume. Are you finished? Well, thank you. How thoughtful. Would you like a chocolate? Um, yeah, sure. Thanks. Oh, sorry, Sheldon, I almost sat in your spot. Did you? I didn't notice. Have a chocolate. <laughs> Turns out I can. Well, you shouldn't. 
There's just no pleasing you, is there, Leonard? You weren't happy with my previous approach to dealing with her, so I decided to employ operant conditioning techniques, building on the works of Thorndike and B.F. Skinner. Yet by this time next week, I believe I can have her jumping out of a pool, balancing a beach ball on her nose. <laughs> Which is probably a bit extreme, but... So now let's get out of that one. And I'll show you another example. I'll show you another example of a common mistake here. And this is positive punishment versus negative reinforcement. This is also from the Big Bang Theory. Let's see if we make it in time here. There we go. Nope. Chromebook presents Chitezka Martinez on the adulthood, a series about finding the way in the modern world. What's good? What did she test?